So my name is Andy Truby, as Jenny said, uh, and I'll be telling you a little bit about Commission One. Uh, probably to, just to set the scene on even what Commission One is, uh, FIB, as Jenny mentioned, is the International Sort of Association for Concrete. Um, it, it, it splits its activities um, into a number of commissions dealing with uh, various aspects of, of concrete. Um, commission one is perhaps the most general being concrete structures. But for example, uh, there's, um, there's commissions for analysis and design, reinforcement, prefabrication, sustainability, durability. And we'll be hearing from uh, another of the commissions after my presentation. So uh, lots of words here. I don't expect you to read them. Um, but uh, th this is this is the motivation, the, 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 the uh, remit, if you like, for Commission One. So Commission One looks at concrete structures. Essentially, what we're looking to do is look a lot across the whole remit of concrete structures um, from their design through to construction um, and uh, maintenance and really look at areas where uh, guidance might be provided. So that's guidance in line with, with European standards generally, but all, also in developing new standards. So uh, there's a reference in the first paragraph here to model code, FIB model code. A lot of you might not be aware of what that is. This, this refers to model code 2010. Um, FIB uh, produces these model codes periodically and they effectively generally become the forerunner to the next iteration of Eurocode or Eurocode 2 in this instance. Um, I think that the, the next speaker, Frank, might say a little bit more about that. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about what, what happens in Commission 1. Um, again, more, more, more names here. Don't bother necessarily trying to digest all the names. What I really wanted to point out was the, the third column and just looking at the representation uh, and you'll see there there's a, there's a lot of the European countries, obviously the UK as well, uh, but also the Far East in, in Japan, um, uh, Australia and Canada. So there's a there's a huge international contribution to uh, to FIB and uh, and everybody, basically everybody works for free. So it's all it's all all the contributions are. Um, you know, uh, not not paid. The FIB has a small core team of staff, but everybody you see on this screen is pretty much uh, does it unpaid. Uh, one thing to note: we're lucky enough in Commission One to have four former, well, the current president of FIB and three former presidents of FIB as part of the grouping. Um, so. I said that the commissions, uh, the FIB is split into commissions. Commission one itself is split into a number of task groups. So as you'll see here, um, so task group 1.1, as Jenny mentioned, my, I, my area is buildings rather than bridges. But for those of you who, who are uh, bridge specialists or interested in bridges, there's a number of working parties underway looking at uh, various aspects of bridge design. Um, so the way that the task groups work is they get together, uh, they brainstorm um, the subject, the topic, and look for interesting areas where guidance might be a bit light or where there's some developments and advancements. Um, so taking the last one here, as I understand it, design loads, there is, the, 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 the standards that we have now are not particularly good for uh, the load application on very long bridges. Um, so as an example. Um, so that's task group one. There's task group two. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit more about this one. This is concrete structures in marine environments. Um, there's a convener is Tor Olley Olson, a, a former president of FIB. And uh, um, Tor is from, uh, Tor Olley's from Norway. Um, they've done a lot of work on floating structures. And uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's a bulletin. So the, the objective of a lot of these task groups is to produce bulletins. So bulletins are, a, you know, as you might expag imagine, a, a report of some sort on the particular topic. And bulletin 91, it uh, probably came out a couple of years ago now, and that's about floating concrete structures. And it's absolutely fascinating what they can do with uh, floating structures. That goes all the way from sort of oil platforms, um, quite a lot of recent stuff on um, wind turbine bases. Um, of course, the beauty with, with floating structures is, is buoyancy. Uh, you know, you can, you can move some colossal weights of structure. If you imagine some ships, if you like, are just a, a, you know, hundreds and hundreds and thousands of tons. Um, so you can uh, construct a construct a, a, an element, float it out to its position, and then sink it to the to the seabed, 
or a lot of times actually leave it floating. Um, you, for those who don't know, you might want to Google um, the Oslo um, Sea Beach, um, which might sound a little bit strange, but in Oslo, um, there's a floating concrete beach, um, which just gives more space at the, at the seafront. A lot of work being done on uh, floating homes, uh, obviously very resistant to uh, changes in sea level and the like. Um, so that, that's one of the task group, one of the working parties under this task group. Another one is submerged two bridges. And there's a bulletin just being produced um, just within the last uh, 12 months, bulletin 96. And that deals with these these things. So uh, the picture of the bulletin on the left there and then the, the image. So you can probably work out what this is. It's a it's a it's a tunnel. Uh, it's on under the underwater level. And uh, the one that we've seen on the right there is uh, is hanging, floating. Uh, from pontoons. So, so that actually this group spent quite a lot of time just defining um, these structures. And uh, um, the, the term they came up with is submerged floating tube bridge. So a lot of you might be looking at that and think, well, it's a tunnel, but is it a tunnel? Um, it looks like it's got a lot of the properties of a tunnel. It's tubular, um, but it's definitely submerged. Um, tunnels tend to be underground or on the seabed. Um, it's floating. So what does floating mean in this instance? Well, it truly is floating. It, uh, you, you'll all remember your Archimedes principle that, uh, that um, you know, that the, um, the, the amount of water, the weight of water displaced gives a buoyancy. So here you can adopt, you could utilize that. So the, the gravity loads on these structures can be moderated or reduced or eliminated uh, uh, by, by the uh, displacement of water. If I show you that a little bit further, uh, on the left-hand side here, it's obviously fairly straightforward, but the, um, the it, you know an underground tunnel goes underground right the way under a water crossing. Uh, an immersed tunnel goes on the bed, um, but a submerged tunnel, or a bridge rather, goes over the top, uh, obviously supported. Um, but we have a number of options for a, a submerged floating tube bridge. It could be, the diagrams on the right, it could be suspended from pontoons. Um, it can be on tension legs uh, to the to the seabed. It could be on compression legs in the third image, or it could, if the span's shorter, it could be free. Now, if you think about the forces on on this structure, um, a lot of the gravity loads, as I say, are balanced by the buoyancy. So you might actually be trying to hold this hold this structure into the water, rather than you know. It, it, so its loads are actually upwards rather than downwards. Obviously, there's a lot of dynamic loads still. You, you haven't got wind action, but you've got wave action. And but often these are placed below the zone of wave action, wave action, but you certainly have underwater currents. Lots of issues to think about in terms of uh, the, you know, whether could a ship impact with this? Uh, they'd generally be put lower than that in the water. So lots of things to think about. Um, the, the, it, for those who are interested, there is a, um, a presentation being produced by FIB. I won't go into detail now, but if you Google uh, the thing along the bottom there on YouTube, you will see um, Ariana, who's, uh, who is the, the chair of this group, uh, taking you through some of the considerations of what you need to think about, um, um, giving some examples of, uh, of these sorts of structures. Um, just as an aside, if you see the, the middle image at the bottom there, uh, this structure is uh, curved on plan. So that gives it some resistance to the sort of horizontal forces from the uh, currents. Uh, you can obviously give it stiffness as the, the smaller image on the right indicates, give it some stiffness in the sort of horizontal direction. Um, and some really exciting, uh, exciting questions, uh, topics. Um, I was going to ask whether we could do a poll, but we, we decided not to do that. So whether any, every, all of you in the audience would be happy to drive through this thing, but and you know, would you feel safe? Um, there's been quite a bit of research done on the safety angle, and uh, a big part of the of the bulletin talks about those sorts of uh, safety issues and reliability issues, and obviously about the joints. Um, one thing that I didn't mention is obviously these things being underwater uh, visually, therefore, don't don't uh, detract from the environment. And uh, there has been a study of uh, such structures in, you know, very beautiful sites like Lake Como in uh, in Italy. Um, so an exciting area for for the future. I did notice for those who take NCE, New Civil Engineer, uh, that the, the image, um, the first image that I showed you, was reproduced in there in last week's edition. 
talking about a potential crossing between uh, England and, no and Northern Ireland. Um, so uh, we'll see if these things ever come to come to fruition. Um, so moving on, my group uh, is uh, task group 1.3, which is buildings. Again, lots of words that I don't need you to uh, to, to uh, work, read. Um, the, the things that we're looking at, uh, we've got two two working parties uh, active at the minute. Uh, structural design of con concrete transfer structures. So that's really big beams within buildings uh, that are transferring loads in somewhere. Um, that not made very much progress on that group. It's uh, sort of still getting itself together and formulating. The second group is planning movement joints in concrete buildings. Um, before I tell you about that, uh, just a little bit of a plug for something that uh, my group produced a little while ago, and that's uh, design guides for tall buildings. So if you haven't seen these publications, uh, the one on the left is, a, is the FIB bulletin 73. Um, in the UK, this is uh, the same document is uh, published by the Concrete Centre. So you'll see that the images uh, on the front are, are similar. Actually, behind the front cover, it's exactly the same document. So going back to movement joints in buildings, so we have a, a working party active. Uh, it's uh, convened by Jeremy Wells, who works for uh, WSP uh, in the UK. And uh, it's pretty active. We've had a, quite a few meetings over the last few months, and we've actually got a further meeting on that tomorrow. Uh, the group consists of about 10 people, uh, mainly UK based, actually, in this instance. Um, so you might think, well, why are we uh, thinking about that some guidance is needed for movement joints. Uh, well, what, what's available currently? This is a, a, an iStruct D guide, and I've highlighted there that uh, guidance would say that joints would be provided at approximately 50 mil centers, 50 meter centers longitudinally and transversely. And there's a few examples of how you might cut up a building with joints. Um, there's some concrete center guidance on that, which takes the joint space in a little bit further and says that you might go between 50 and 70 meters between joints. And that, that might be fine for a lot of buildings that are that, are that sort of size or smaller. Um, but the question really comes when you get a monster such as this. This is a, it's a project I worked on a few years ago now. It's uh, Penbury Hospital in Tunbridge Wells. Uh, so it's a, it's a hospital, it's seven stories. Uh, it's got a changing level across the site of two stories. So the, the back of the building's uh, two stories higher than the front. Um, it's it's a mixture of what it's a hospital. So it's got everything that hospital has of operating theatres, wards and the like. Um, big multi-story car park at the far end um, and then an energy centre, loads and loads of other elements. And if we look at that on plan, it's something like 210 metres long and 113 meters wide. It's uh, It's got these fingers stick out. Um, it's got cutbacks. It's, uh, and as I say, at the end of the day, it's a hospital. So you use the guidance there to say, how might you split that up? And uh, our first felt tip pen guess might be to split it like this. Uh, that would produce a longest element of about 70 meters, which working on the guidance kind of just about works. You've obviously got to also think about all the other sorts of things. Are the individual blocks stable? So do they have their own shear, shear, you know, stability system? Do you carry, carry any forces across the joint? More critical in this building is that the fact that it's a hospital and, and this might be a lovely place. The, these lines might be a lovely place to put joints. But if they go through an operating theater or even a, a cafeteria, even a, a ward, um, the architect doesn't like it very much and it you know, becomes impractical. There's also a total length at this level of 240 metres. If you, if you multiply that up through all the floors, that's a, not a lot of length of joint. It's an expensive thing to do. They need maintenance. Uh, they affect the floor finishes. They affect hygiene control. So lots to think about. Now, on this particular project, we spent a lot of time studying options. Um, again, don't really need you to read any of these figures, but it is possible to simulate shortening within the within the structure and look at what would happen if we, what, what is the effect of movement joints and having them? How does the concrete behave in the short term and the long term? Um, and to cut a long story short, uh, we ended up reducing the length of uh, movement joint on this building to the to the red lines. Uh, so we split it into four principal blocks. But some of the remaining blocks are still 140 meters long. So that the blue dotted lines here are actually a 90 day joint. So that's where we left a gap in the structure 
uh, for 90 days and then uh, infilled it afterwards. I didn't mention earlier this is a post-tension structure. Um, so that adds its own considerations. So the, uh, the other thing we had on this particular building was other temporary joints, uh, shorter, shorter interval joints, a bit like uh, Camilla was mentioning earlier, where we stitched, stitched the slab together after the initial shortening and movement has taken place. So the, the guidance that we're looking to produce is, is to give the engineer um, a bit more in his armory to, of how to consider what's practical, what, what might be allowed in terms of movement joint positions, and really allowing that to be thought through in terms of bigger structures that we're seeing uh, much more commonly these days. Uh, moving on, uh, there's another task group on tunnels. Uh, I need to move a bit more quickly now, but uh, as you can see, there are a number of working parties. So any of you who are interested in tunnels, uh, there's been a lot of work done. There's already a bulletin there on uh, uh, fiber reinforced uh, in concrete in tunnels, mainly in the tunnel lining segments, um, but there's active work going on there. Um, our current president of FIB, Akio as, uh, leads a group on structural sustainability. And this is really trying to focus sustainability questions, some of which we've touched on earlier, but focusing on the structure. Um, I think it's easy to talk about renewables and, and other things and get, get taken, uh, get, get, have the discussion led by other disciplines. But we as structural engineers must think about our own uh, discipline and uh, focus on, on on the structure, and some of the some of the focus here is on uh, the life of the building, and more importantly, its life after its current use. So, you know, making making buildings more adaptable for the future, um, because we, we we can make concrete structures with a very long design life, and that design life will probably exceed the use that it's current that it's designed for. So we ought to, we have a duty to, 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 the, to society really to, uh, to think about that when we're designing structures. And, and this group will produce guidance on that. But there's a group going on history of uh, concrete structures. Again, I won't tell you too much about this, but they're looking right back, looking at almost like a textbook type thing, looking at the developments of concrete through the ages, right back from Roman times, through the development of reinforced concrete, pre-stressed concrete, looking at shell structures, uh, as Cam Camilla was talking about earlier, and bring it right up to date. There's so much work in there that's probably going to come out in two bullet bulletins, um, uh, you know, dealing with different uh, periods in, in history. Um, there's another group on uh, concrete uh, in, during construction. Uh, again, self-explanatory, but they'll be producing guidance on the con to answer some of the questions that, uh, that you all raised of, what you do with concrete mixes in shell structures and how do you place concrete on a slope and um you know so there's work going on in that group to uh, to to assist in those sorts of areas and as you're probably getting a feel for here it we're, we're looking to provide guidance that goes beyond what the code says it's uh, how you do how you do things how you move it to uh, move it forward um and the final task group is uh, concrete industrial fours it's perhaps a bit of a niche area. I don't know how many of you have, uh, have been involved with uh, with concrete industrial floors, but uh, they're a bit of a specialist area. So generally a ground bearing slab, um, you know, big, usually big, big spaces, big, big factories and uh, storage areas. Um, quite unusual loading because it's generally a point load dominated by point loads. Um, the slab's usually continuously supported on a on a good sub base. It doesn't it's not a spanning structure in that sense, but the point loads can be very high because you have high bear racking um, with you know coming down on legs with quite small feet. Uh, you have forklift trusts running around, lifting things at high level, putting very big forces on their solid wheels. Um, joints are a major problem. Um, cracking can be a major problem. Um, we do have a guide in the UK from the uh, uh, from the Concrete uh, Society, the Technical Report 34, seem to, seem to recall. Well, this just takes the guide, that guidance and, and takes it a bit further. So um, I've already explained some of this stuff. So there's, there's, there's you know, lots to think about, lots of focus on joints. Um, on the right-hand side, there's the, there's the members of the task group, um, but, but on the left-hand side just shows you the coverage. Um, so looking right through at different types of finishing, 
whether you should use fibers. Fibers are very commonly used now in this sort of structure, um, more so perhaps than reinforced concrete. Very good at distributing stresses, obviously. But there's a lot to think about in terms of layout, isolation from supporting structures, really allowing the slab to be free to move. Um, a lot of work being done in with non-metallic rebar, very interesting area. Um, you know, as I've said, lots of things to think about in fiber reinforced concrete. Joints are key in this and, and really clients don't want joints. Joints are just a maintenance problem. There are, there's a point, there are a point of failure, concrete cracks. So, you know, often there's a push to do bigger and bigger pores. So therefore you need to be more thinking about the, the shrinkage and movement of the slab and allowing free movement where you, where you possibly can. And there's obviously more sophisticated analysis coming into this, looking at the nonlinear approach. Tolerances are a huge issue in these elements. Um, flatness is absolutely key because the, the effect on a forklift uh, traveling around a slab of, of inclines um, does affect its stability, particularly when it's in its lifting mode. Obviously, there's lots to think about in terms of sustainability. And ongoing maintenance is a huge issue, uh, particularly if you have defects. So, so th this guide um, is a bulletin which is due out any time now. Um, it's actually fully drafted. It's with the uh, FIB uh, editorial team, and we'll see it coming uh, coming out very shortly. It's just going through its sort of final approval stage, although it's been approved by Commission One for issue. So. A very quick trot through uh, everything that uh, that we're doing in Commission One. Um, if you want more information, there's a there's a website link there that gives you sort of the general structure and who's involved. And uh, hopefully that's uh, been of interest. Good evening, everybody. My name is Frank Dean, and I would like to give you a very brief overview about the activities of Commission Four. And as Andy already mentioned, that uh, FIB and the technical work of FIB is mainly in the commissions and it's divided in several groups in these commissions. We are doing a lot of work, but it's mainly pre-normative work. That's also mentioned by uh, Andy and uh, it's up more or less to the code makers to the standardization bodies, whether they adopt uh, that documents and the results gained in the several FIB commissions and the FIB task groups. And I would like to particularly talk about this evening about the activities of Commission 4. And Commission 4 is devoted to, uh, uh, to um, concrete and co concrete technology. Okay, um, as maybe not all of you uh, are familiar with uh, the structure of FIB, I would like to particularly emphasize the terms of reference uh, for Commission 4 and the scope. And for all task groups and all working parties and, and uh, commissions, you can find further information in the directory. Uh, of FIB, uh, where you also have some indications about the statutes in about the organization of FIB in general, and uh, maybe the the whole technical work of commissions and task groups will be intensively discussed within the so-called technical council. The technical council is the technical body which approves new initiatives from task groups from commissions. That means new technical issues are they they're discussed and finally approved and then launched in uh, the working parties technical and in, in the task groups and in the commissions and you can find here in this directory which uh, was released in 2019 a very good overview and a very actual overview about the different commissions and the working parties task groups of FIB however the Secretariat presently is working intensively on the new version of the director and will be released this year in 2021. So for keeping you updated, I would recommend to look into the, this document, which will hopefully be released by the mid of this year. And you can find further information on the website of FIB. 
But coming back to Commission 4 on concrete and concrete technology, some brief introduction about the terms of reference and uh, the scope. Uh, this is a, a scan out of this directory. It was the same which you have seen in the presentation of Andy Druby. This was for Commission 1, of course. You can see it now for Commission 4. And every commission gives itself a kind of a background and of a scope which fits into the strategy and into the philosophy of the FIB. And this was uh, intro introduced by, by Jenny in her introductory uh, comments about FIB. What is the, the idea behind FIB? It is a national uh, based organization by different uh, national member groups, like for example, in the UK, for example, in Germany. In total, we have about 20, uh, sorry, 42 national member groups worldwide. And based on this information on this international level, we can really define FIB as the international community for concrete. And that's why it's called International Federation for Structural Concrete. You can see here this term for references for, um, for the Commission 4 for Concrete and Concrete Technology. And you can see here in this, in this box, which I show you here on this slide, the intention and the aim of Commission 4. And it's mainly the provision of models mainly on constitutive models to describe the behavior of concrete. And this is still quite challenging, even though we're working with concrete for decades or even for centuries, we're still gaining new experience. We're still gaining new results uh, out of research, but also from the practice. And this is also very important for FLB that, that we have this merge between fundamental research and the practice, and that's why we can provide from several perspectives information, not only to the members of the FIB, but also to the concrete community. And for the Commission 4, we have this, uh, let's say, uh, ambition and this aspiration to provide models on a code type manner. Uh, and this, for example, can be uh, found in the FIB model codes which I come back to this issue later on. Uh, what are the initiatives in developing model codes? And we are close, uh, let's say, to uh, a very, very important working step for the new model code 2020, which is uh, under preparation. So for Commission 4, we have this behavioral models and the design recommendations for practical applications. So even though we would, we will provide constitutive models. We never forget how the models can be used in practice. And that's why we're looking from fundamental models to engineering models. The areas, the technical working areas and the interests of uh, um, the Commission for uh, task groups and the of Commission for in general, you see a very wide spectrum of um, uh, things we consider uh, in uh, Commission 4. Mainly it's still based on traditional composed concretes based on cement as a binding material, but uh, related to the overall discussion about sustainability, about the carbon footprint and so on, we also tackle, of course, the new types of binders like uh, alkaline activated binders, geopolymer binders, low carbon concrete, and so on. And also, as mentioned by Andy, we have also a task group which looks into high performance materials and into high performance reinforcement materials to enhance the mechanical properties of these new types of materials. Uh, this wide spectrum uh, of activities is uh, considered in uh, task groups. And uh, I would like to give you a brief overview about the task groups. If you would like to have further information, this was also mentioned by Andy Druby, you can look into the website of FIB and then you have the indications for this several commissions we have, Commission 1, 
on concrete structures or on commission four here on concrete and concrete technology as said i would like to give you a brief overview about the structure of commission four so the structure of commission four uh, is uh, mainly the work in the task groups and uh, of course we also release uh, some bulletins to display our work, the results of our discussions. And uh, presently we have four existing task groups, 4.1 and uh, up to 4.4. I will describe the scope in general uh, uh, later on. And we have just started four new task groups by the end of last year and at the beginning of this year, task group 4.4 and 4.8. Also, for these new task groups, I will show you the terms of references. What is the idea behind these new task groups? We have published recently uh, some bulletins, uh, bulletin 42 and uh, 70. And 42 is, for example, a compilation of constitutive models for high performance concretes or high strength concretes. And this is a, a document which was uh, released some some years ago this is a more recent one on core type model for concrete behavior and this is the background uh, document for model code uh, 2010 presently one of the task groups in uh, commission 4 is working on the background document also for the new model code 2020 so you see this is an ongoing process to provide as much as background information as possible to the community to understand what is written in the model code and why we derived these models from uh, uh, research and from the, the, the experience we, we had from the praxis and the, in, the input from, the, from, from practice. Okay, about the existing working groups and the bulletins in preparation, a brief overview. Uh, first of all, we have task group 4.1 on fiber reinforced concrete. Chair lady is Lucy van der Waal from Belgium in Leuven. And uh, this was a very intensive work and it took almost eight years to provide uh, the state of the art report, which is already reviewed by uh, reviewers from FIB, but also from external reviewers. And then because of the status of a state of the art report, it needs to be approved by Commission 4. And this should be uh, done in uh, uh, by the mid of this year. So we we quite hopeful that uh, this document uh, will be published by the end of 2021. The same applies for the document on ultra high performance fiber reinforced concrete. And uh, this is an, an issue which also took some time because people realized that UHPC uh, particular needs to be reinforced mainly by fibers. And that's why it was a merger between 4.1 and 4.2. So there will be a compiled document, a comprehensive document, which covers the fiber reinforced concrete, the normal strength fiber reinforced concrete, and also the ultra high performance fiber reinforced concrete. And also for the new FRB model code 2000 uh, or for, for 2020, there will be a consistent design model which covers normal strengths and high strengths or even up to ultra high strength when the concrete is fiber reinforced. Then we have task group uh, 4.3 in structural design with flowable concrete. Uh, chair persons are Stefan Grunewald from the Netherlands and Liberato Ferrara from Italy. And uh, this is mainly related to self-compacting concrete or concretes with a very high flowability and also uh, plain concrete and fiber reinforced uh, flowable concrete is covered by this uh, state-of-the-art report. We hope that also this state-of-the-art report uh, will be released in 2021. It is already completed, however, it needs to be reviewed and approved by Commission 4. And uh, last but not least, for the existing ones, for the existing task groups, we have aesthetics of concrete surfaces. Ludger Lohaus from Germany, from Hanover, 
He is the chairperson, and we're presently working on the bulletin, also a state of the art report on technology of aesthetics and aesthetics of exposed concrete surfaces. Uh, it is an issue presently uh, about the copyright of the pictures, which is always a problem, but uh, we try to solve it uh, within this year. Then it, the document will be reviewed and finally approved by Commission 4. Then next step would then be that the Secretariat will doing the editorial work and hopefully also this document will be published in 2021. Okay, as I said, we have new task groups uh, which have been launched uh, last year, by the end of last year, 2020. Uh, some of them will start this year in 2021. And I would like to give you a brief overview about the, uh, um, the scope of, for example, task group 4.1, time-dependent behavior of concrete. Chairperson is Roman Wendtner uh, from Belgium. He's working in Ghent. And the idea behind this task group is the uh, that we want to provide prediction models as a function of time and temperature. And for example, or specifically, we would like to provide coupled hydrothermal and chemical physical models for creep and shrinkage for new types of binders, for new precursors, and not only for, let's say, traditional composed concretes, but also for new composed concretes. And uh, of course, if we want to provide this model in contrast to the present mathematical fitting uh, of uh, experimental results, which we have in our uh, codes. Then we have um, task group 4.6, constitutive laws of concrete to supplementary materials. Chair is Frankulis Canavaris from Arup in the UK. And uh, the scope is checking the applicability of models given in the old model code, but also for the new model code. If we apply larger quantities of supplementary cementitious materials, the traditional ones, let's say fly ash or slag, but even new ones like hulls and clays, or for example, also thermal and mechanical treated uh, crushed sand which can be activated also and used as a kind of a, a cement replacement. Then we have task group 4.7, structural applications of recycled aggregate concrete properties, modeling and design. Chairman persons are uh, Nicola Tosic from Spain, from Barcelona, uh, from, um, uh, yes, from Barcelona, and uh, Jean-Michel Torrenti from France. And very easy. The, the amount of uh, crushed aggregates is increasing from demolition of, of, of structures, from concrete structures. So there is a need to look into the provision of models for mechanical and structural applications for reinforced and precessed structures when they are made of recycled aggregate concrete. And that's the idea behind uh, this task group. And last but not least, uh, the task group 4.8, Chairperson is Martin Sier from France uh, about low carbon concrete, also a very important issue from a sustainability point of view and from a car, uh, CO2 emission point of view that we look into low CO2 concretes. And also in this task group, we look for new and innovative materials like, for example, geopolymers or alkaline activated materials. As I said before, and this is uh, the will brings me to the end of my presentation uh, this evening, uh, that commissions and the task groups uh, intensively contribute to the model code, which is the main or core document of FIB. It is a pre-normative document, and code makers worldwide can take this document as a basis for the standardization process like it is done in Europe. Oh, that means uh, model code 2010. You can see it here on this uh, uh, slide here. This was the background document, more or less the background document for the new Eurocode 2. Other countries fully adopt or fully uh, take into account the FRB model codes. For example, model code 2010 was uh, fully installed in uh, or taken into account uh, in uh, Brazil, for example, uh, 
And the different task groups and commissions provide information for the model codes as it has done been done for the uh, uh, model code 2010, chapter 5.1 on concrete. This was the uh, work done in commission four and for the new tie for the new model code 2020, which is under preparation. And Stuart Matthews from the UK, he is the convener of task code 10.1. So he is in charge for the preparation of the model code. It's a very challenging and intensive work. And uh, also for this new model code, uh, Commission 4 is uh, contributing intensively Chapter 12 on concrete, fiber-enforced concrete, UHPC. And which is what is very important is uh, that we introduce also conditioned limit state associated with durability. So we have another commission in FIB on durability. And of course, from a material perspective, that means Commission 4, it's essential to discuss the durability properties with Commission 8. And this is an ongoing discussion we have, a very intensive discussion to provide the input for the uh, new FRB model code 2020. Okay, that's it. I think, and I hope, of course, it was a, a, a information for you, which is which was new about the, the activities in Commission 4. And I thank you for your kind attention. And I'm looking forward to your questions. So uh, I think the first questions, and the, we've got a couple of questions, one question and one answer. Um, from, well, the question from Lynn Macbeth was almost answered by you, um, Andy. Uh, is this, uh, the, uh, this is about the, um, the floating bridges. Is this a feasible option for the Boris Bridge? Um, uh, and uh, an answer, a sort of answer from David Scott saying the submerged tubular bridge crossing from Scotland to Northern Ireland uh, might have one or two concerns for the Fastlane um, Royal Navy nuclear submarine base. Um, but what do you reckon, um, Andy? Are we um, well, going to be looking at this for an option for well, this uh, Boris Bridge? Yeah, well, if you remember earlier on, I said that I'm a buildings man, not a bridges man. But but uh, when I uh, when I heard about the Boris Bridge idea, I think he he was going Scotland to Northern Ireland, wasn't he? And, and you look at the distances involved, and apparently the seabed levels, and you know, a bridge was you know seems like a, a, a massive stretch of uh, of uh, sort of um, credibility. But I think these sort of structures do get, do sort of start to answer those those questions. Uh, obviously, you've got options of tethering to the seabed of floating from pontoons. There's certainly quite an issue about sort of uh, uh, strike by ships and uh, and submarines. And I'm disappointed now that I didn't show an image from the uh, bulletin which shows a submarine navigating its way through um, underneath one of these submerged bridges. So it, it's obviously something to question, um, but, but you could imagine that uh, you know, if if you if you think about uh, vehicle protect, you know, shipping protection from uh, obstacles, um, there's also nets. There's all sorts of things that uh, that you can do. So, so I don't think that um, submarines, in their own right, uh, rule out this sort of a structure. But certainly, it would need to be con considered, and, and uh, perhaps more so in an area where submarines are more prevalent. If anybody Absolutely. knows where submarines are prevalent, I'm not sure. Uh, there's another question from David Scott, um, and this is about post tension structures. So this is massively in your in your area, Andy. Um, uh, he says, "I've been asked to examine a structure where about double the predicted movement occurred at a joint. No satisfactory explanation has been offered as to why. Can you comment on the variability of shrinkage, shortening, creep movements, and how ac accurate do movement predictions generally prove to be?" Um. Yeah, I can comment on that. It's a little bit off topic, I suppose, but uh, but interesting all the same. Uh, certainly on the on the movement joint situation, um, post tension slabs, slabs give you an extra set of considerations in that you get uh, two main factors that uh, that add to a, a normal concrete structure. Uh, the first is elastic shortening. So as you apply the pre stress, you get an instantaneous elastic shortening. So the the slab wants to become shorter. It could obviously be restrained from doing that, but in which case the concrete might crack and uh, you're not really getting your pre-stress. So generally that movement does occur. 
that's usually pretty easy to calculate um, because you know what the force is and you you, you know what the E value is. Uh, but uh, as Frank will probably tell us, the E value is constantly varying. So there's a question about at what stage, what the E value is at the time that you stress. Um, then the other characteristic is we all know about uh, creeping concrete. Well, you also, because of that axial force, you also get an axial creep. So you get a further shortening due to creep shortening. So those two factors need to add on. Um, if you compare a PT slab with a reinforced slab uh, and think about strains, you might get a shrinkage strain of something like 400 times 10 to minus 6 units sort of thing. Um, and in a post-tension slab, that might go up to 600. So it's perhaps 50% more. They're very generalized figures, and it depends on the amount of pre-stress and things. In terms of whether how predictions work, uh, most predictions of movement tend to over-predict. Um, but uh, what can happen sometimes with a post-tension structure is you think it's going to move from each end. And what happens is it locks up at one end and therefore you see all the movement occurring at the other end. And uh, I have had instances myself of uh, inspecting structures, very long structures where the joints, the movement joints have opened up more than expected. And that's generally being explained by um, the movement and the stiffness of the structure not being properly considered when the movement joints were designed and the movement was calculated. I don't know whether that helps, but Thank, thanks, Andy. Um, I've got a question for Frank uh, from Brian O'Rourke. Um, uh, and he says, is your commission working on the specification of structural concrete by exposure resistance classes, uh, uh, like they're being introduced into EN206 and Eurocode 2? Yes, um, we, we're working on it. And uh, we work particularly for the new FRB model code on this issue. And all the discussion, which is now uh, within, let's say, the Eurocode 2 co commissions and the Eurocode 2 um, uh, parties, this is originally uh, based in the FIB commissions. So the, the background which uh, we now need for the exposure classes on the discussion on the exposure classes for Eurocode 2 was uh, uh, previously discussed within FIB and this is an ongoing process. So also for the new model code 2020, there will be a, a kind of an evolution of this exposure uh, uh, resistance classes, which we now uh, also discuss on a European standardization level. Thank you. Um, I've got another question for you, Frank. Um, it's from Pierre Francesco Valiero from um, How is England? Um, and he's uh, the new task groups you've got in Commission 4 all look to be really interesting. Um, and he's wondering, uh, are they going to be be preparing new bulletins and what's the time scale for those new bulletins if they are if they're going to be there that that's a very good question um, uh, as i said one of these task groups start uh, shortly their their, their work um, normally we say that within f four to five years uh, such bulletins uh, can be prepared so it's a partly a, a very long process but uh, if we have young engaged people uh, in the task groups uh, then we can speed up this process uh, so I would like to ask uh, also people in the audience if they are interested in the work in the task group as many people we have we can uh, speed up we can accelerate this process preparing such state-of-the-art reports or the bulletins we need some fresh blood <laughs> And and if if anybody's listening who's interested, where should they apply to? Uh, you can send me an email, or you can if you go to, on the FIB website, you can see uh, the uh, description and, or the descriptions of the task groups. You can directly um, uh, send an email, a message uh, to the task group conveners. They are they are happy to to answer the questions, and of course they. Um, quite motivated to ask people to join. Thanks, Frank. 
could I just uh, just echo that that the that the working convening a task group and a, and a working party is is it, there's a lot of work involved and it does take a lot of time there's a there's a lot of people to draw together and uh, you know some of the audience might be horrified that it takes four or five years to produce this sort of guidance but there's there is a lot of work to it and uh, I just echo what Frank said that uh, the more sort of willing people we have to contribute and comment and do some of that help with that legwork. It really speeds the process up. Um, there are obviously some editorial parts and approval parts that take some time. And uh, I, I came into this a few, well, a number of years, 10 or 12 years ago, and my first bulletin, I thought it would take us 18 months. And uh, that was, was going quickly. And I think it took nearly three years, but it still felt fast at the time because there was a lot of work to do. And of course, it's, it's a voluntary work. Yeah. That's that's one important issue, and it's uh, the work is uh, based on consensus. And as we have this international perspective, we take into account all information, all perspectives on on from 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 the from the from the participants in the in the task groups, and that's why it takes sometimes longer to find consensus. Right. Thank you very much. Um, there's a question here from uh, Uriel Arias, um, and he says, interesting subjects. How do we access all these papers shown in the slides? Um, uh, the answer to that is become a member of FEB. Well, let, let me answer <laughs> that. I think it, it is that. But, but the, the, uh, the, the publications can be purchased so without, without uh, joining FEB. So you can just go online and publish uh, and uh, select a, a publication and purchase it. Um, Actually, membership of FIB is quite modest as an individual member, so you might want to do that, and that gives you access to documents, uh, discounted price for purchasing documents, but also viewing of uh, pre of all the documents. Um, there's there's the UK member, there's, sorry, there's the national member group. So in, in the UK, that's FIB UK, who are uh, presenting and sort of. Uh, promoting this talk this evening. So that that that's a sort of corporate membership. So your organization might want to join as a corporate member to FIB UK, and then we're affiliated to FIB internationally. And any FIB UK member gets access to uh, to the, all of the documents. They get hard copies. Uh, they also get reduced, um, reduced, uh, cost, uh, reduced uh, admission costs for events. Uh, all a lot of our events are free. And again, the, the cost of that is is quite small for uh, even, you know, my organization is two people and we're, we're members of, uh, of the FIB UK uh, grouping. So I'd really promote that you, you, you look into that and there's some really good information available. 